I'm going to try to be uh, a little bit of a, a panel host or a master of ceremonies here. Uh, not something that's uh, particularly in my skill set, but we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, the, um, the the guys have uh, have kind of gotten uh, uh, you know we have a little bit of a of an agenda to uh, things to go uh, you know go down a list here of things that they want to talk about. So we'll go down through that list, um, but they may want to bring in some other things, and we may want to digress. And, and by all means, again, we want to invite everybody who's here at the meeting to uh, jump in with any uh, questions or observations. Uh, I, 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 I've been calling this a barely controlled chaos. That's uh, that's pretty much our goal for the evening here. So we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, I thought we should have. We should have promoted this. We should have named this uh, uh, the uh, the meeting about restoration philosophies, advice, warnings, heartwarming happenings, and uh, horror stories. Because I think we have a little bit of all of that coming in from the guys. So uh, that'll be kind of uh, kind of interesting. Um, I think the two the two main areas that, that are going to be covered tonight are are restoration philosophies, different ways to uh, to do things, and. Um, I, uh, I, I, I won't tell the story again, but I, I'm always charmed by the fact that we had a, a slight disagreement of opinion at one of our local antique radio club meetings, and it, it practically devolved into fisticuffs. So people can be pretty passionate about the right and wrong ways to do this stuff. That might just be taking it a little bit too far. Um, and then the, uh, the whole uh, concept of you know, looking at uh, restoring televisions as a business uh, which a few people do versus as a hobby, which, which, which is what most of us do. Um, so, um, so with that, I guess uh, if we could have our, uh, our three uh, panelists, our, our, our mystery panelists enter and sign in, please. Um, the, um, uh, Chuck, you want to, you, you want to sign in and say hi here? Sure. Why not? I guess you can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> I sound a little strange because my, as I told you, I'm sort of plugged up today. Uh, yeah, I've been, I don't know what else to tell about what it is, but hi, I've been doing repairs on my own stuff and customers, so to speak, for probably 30 some years now. Um, going through a lot of televisions and a lot of radios, a lot of test equipment, and everything else. And I do have a certain way that I do my restorations and <clears throat> to make the first part of this short is my only philosophy on all this work has always been, I don't ever want to see a customer's piece back on my bench again when it leaves here. Chuck, uh, where, where are you located? I'm in uh, Pennsylvania, little town, Perkasy, Pennsylvania. I'm about 30 miles north of Philadelphia. Okay, well, let's let's uh, get the other guys introduced, then yeah. we can get into the uh, the questions. So, uh, Dan, you want to say hi? Are you Dan? You have electricity, or are you running on battery power? <laughs> no, I'm uh, I'm doing the Amish thing. I got a couple of old Coleman lanterns uh, in the living room here, so hence the odd lighting. So, uh, apologies for that, but uh, making do with what I got. Zoom by candlelight. Wow, that's a that's a novel <laughs> approach. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you want to take the, the, a few seconds to introduce yourself to people who may not know you? Yeah, um, I'm Dan Jones. I'm part of the, uh, the ETF board, but um, I've been restoring TVs for about 10 years, a little bit longer. Um, I kind of moonlight at uh, Northern Audio Service in Madison Heights, Michigan, um, doing radio repair, um, other whatever jobs Mike has for me to do. Um, but sometimes people will call and say, Hey, I've got an old TV. Do you guys work on those? And he says, no, but we got a guy who does. So he gives them to me. And, you know, if I've got the time or I'm willing to take it on, I'll call the person and uh, see what they've got and see what they want to do. But, um, yeah, I'm located just outside the Detroit area and, uh, uh and you're flanging out from uh, low bandwidth. All right. Well, let's see if, uh, if we can get Dan back on. But in the meantime, uh, oh. it's probably jammed here. 
Okay. Um, Bob, you wanna you wanna jump in and say hi as our probably our uh, our, our most well known uh, presenter after that spectacularly uh, well received meeting a while back. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Bob Anderson. I'm uh, in Chicago, Northwest Side. Uh, I've been tinkering with vintage TVs my whole life, but seriously for about 15, 20 years now. I have a full-time job as a programmer, so this is definitely a side gig. Started as a hobby. Uh, I didn't really plan on making it into a business or doing it for other people, but I started getting a lot of requests. Uh, surprisingly, I apparently am the only one in this area that works on vintage TVs. And I started getting more and more people asking me, and I'm also on YouTube. I've been doing YouTube videos initially for my own projects, but people would see me and say, hey, I've got an old TV. I've been trying to find somebody for years to fix it. Can you help me out? They broke, they wore me down eventually. <laughs> I have about a hundred TVs of my own that I want to fix up. Uh, but I've been pounded so much, people begging me basically to fix their TVs that I've relented. And I've been kind of going back and forth every other set, do one of mine, one of theirs. <laughs> Most recently, I, for better or worse, decided to focus on predictors. And I've got about, I've just finished about a dozen and I've got about 20 more to do. So about two years <laughs> solidly booked of just predictive television. A, a glutton <laughs> <of fun. laughs> yes. All right. Well, um, I, I got a, a list of things that, uh, that, you know, the guys went over with me ahead of time where we might go on this. But uh, I'll just mention that the um, maybe the genesis of this uh, meeting or the spark behind it was a conversation that I had with Chuck at one point where um, we were talking about how he has all of this um, fantastically uh, for, formerly fantastically expensive laboratory grade service equipment that he likes to use to work on the sets. And, uh, and, and some people think that's a wonderful idea and other people think that that's a terrible idea, maybe because they're jealous of him having all this fancy equipment, or for some reason there seems to be a philosophical argument that if you're gonna work on the old sets, you should use the old equipment. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of issues related to different philosophies of uh, restoring the set. So um, maybe since I just uh, name dropped there, Chuck, if you want to start, maybe talk about that a little bit, and then we can just sort of, you know, everybody else can jump in as, uh, as the, the conversation veers out of control uh, during the meeting here. Okay. If we won't get into that part of it. <clears throat> yeah, I do use all my test equipment that I use for repairing is modern, meaning probably 1990s through 2000 um, HP Tektronics equipment uh, and a few other little odds and ends that I picked up. And I've started doing it also with vintage test equipment, but learned later that truthfully, you start spending too much time trying to keep your vintage equipment working correctly and not having really any idea of what the quality of it is. So, Basically, I have, and for, for like, let's just take something that very few people like to do is sweep. For sweeping like IFs and the whatnot. And there I've got probably four different sweep setups in here. HP, Tektronix, uh, and probably my most fancy one I, uh, that I like to use is a little Japanese piece that, that was built for assembly line work. Set up two coax cables, hook it up and everything, just program what you need into it and you sweep it just that quick. Um, same thing with uh, doing uh, setups with um, the waveform pieces. Uh, I use a, you know, a modern uh, Phillips piece that has all the digitally generated test signals, <clears throat> stair steps, color bars, the whole nine yards. And I use that for doing fine tuning also. But again, that's all the fancy stuff. And really what it boils down to is the two biggest pieces, the most common pieces that I use is a, a good VOM 
and a scope, a good scope that's capable of being triggered on vertical and horizontal sync signals, be it a modern, you know, uh, completely digital uh, Rigol unit or a 500 series Tektronix scopes. And the problem with, well, the Tektronix scopes are nice because they warm the basement down here. But, uh, but either one of them work fine for doing that. Uh, and you don't really need most of the equipment, most of the tests, you know, the SAM, the real fancy equipment to do simple repairs. Uh, I'm one that, uh, going off the other side, I'm one that doesn't believe in having to own uh, the most, most modern uh, tube tester there is. I have, again, I've got three or four different ones from just general purpose ones up to TV, uh, tube analyzers to curve tracers. But really the only thing I use a tube checker for is to check a tube for shorts. That's it. As I've been told a number of times in the old days, the best piece of equipment for a tube is the piece of equipment that it's going into. If it works in there, that's where it stays. Okay. I'll leave that well, little part I'm open. Here. No, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I just, like I said, I'm, I said my first little piece, so let's take it from there, Dave. Yep. Yeah, we got a lot to cover. So, uh, uh, Bob or Dan, you want to jump in and uh, talk about uh, uh, service equipment? Yeah, I'll jump in. I agree with everything he just said. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a very similar philosophy. And for all this, when I first got into the hobby, I thought it would be fun to have vintage test equipment and be back in the 50s until I actually started using it and realized that it's not much fun. And as you say, even when maintaining it and knowing that it is working right and is accurate is just, it's not much fun. Uh, especially when you don't have a lot of time, I want to just turn on a piece of equipment and work on my project, not have to let it warm up and calibrate it and, and all that. So, yes. And uh, I've also very recently was accused of not being competent because I did not have a wall of test equipment behind me, as <laughs> some other guys do. And I, I've never understood that when you have guys that have 30 scopes and 30 RF gen. I have my favorite multimeter. I have my favorite RF generator, stuff that I use all day, every day that I trust. I know how to use it. Four or five pieces of test equipment will do 99% of what I need to do. Yeah, I also use a modern sweep generator. I have uh, a wave tech that just because I happen to get a good deal on it, it works great. Uh, most of my stuff is also from the 90s. Uh, oldest thing I have is a Tektronix. I think it's a 453 scope just because it has wonderful bandwidth and really bright, crisp display. Um, but even that, I don't, I don't need that much bandwidth to work on a TV. But yeah, I, uh, I just have a handful of favorite equipment that um, I'm very familiar with, and that gets the job done, and that's what I go yeah, with. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent there because same thing with mine. Basically, I have one stack of equipment that pretty much goes with doing certain pieces of work. Now on my bench, there's like four different benches here. But usually it's a, you're just sitting on one part of the bench and it's got the meter that I use, the generator I use, and you know uh, a scope that I use. And that's it. That's pretty much will cover, like you say, covers 99% of the stuff that comes in. And you get, you know, you'll get a piece that's unusual that you really need some crazy ass piece of equipment. And now as you go down, I go down to the bottom basement and go searching through stacks of it and find, oh, that's the piece that'll do it. And then haul it up, and like you say, put it on a bench, turn it on. Does it still work? It hasn't been used in, you know, in six, eight months. Says, okay, let's check that out. And it's like, God, do I really need to do this? But you know, sometimes you do to get some of these crazy ass sets to work. And testing tubes, that can be a whole. I agree with you, Kaboot. Test it for shorts, and then yep. put it in the sets if it works. But the guys who worry about the micro mos and match tubes and all. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and that, by the way, I don't work on amplifiers, audio equipment for exactly that reason. I don't want to have to deal with the guys who want matched sets of tubes and all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I, I basically go away from that kind of side. I do it, but I don't really like it because you can never... Television's I found over the years is not a real problem. Everybody seems to see the same thing. Okay, <laughs> audio, put 10 people in the same room, play the same content, the same amplifier, everything's the same, and you'll get 10 different answers to whether or not it's a piece of shit or it's a fantastic piece. <laughs> and you get these people in here and you do all the work, you bring it back to the, to the spec that it called for, and they come in, oh, it doesn't sound right. <laughs> okay, so it's back to what do you want to hear? I'll make right, it sound right. like you tell me. If you can tell me what you want, I'll make it sound that way. It won't be original anymore, but it'll sound the way you want it. And then they're happy. You know, how can you do it? At least with the TV, they seem to all come up with the same thing. Yeah, it looks great. And that's it. <laughs> right. okay. yeah, yeah, I agree with uh I agree with both you guys. Um, you know, I've got a got a handful of, of equipment that I will use, um, a meter, um, oscilloscope, um, sometimes a VTVM if I'm trying to to see, you know, am I peaking a coil or whatever. But uh you know, I, I had a friend visit who he took one look at my bench. He says, so how much of that stuff do you actually use? And uh, I said, maybe a fifth of it I use regularly. The other stuff, I pull it down from the shelf maybe once a year because I have that one oddball thing I need it for. But when I got into the hobby, I was sort of a test equipment junkie. I was just buying the stuff because it was cool and oh, something else to fix up and that. But then, you know, like you said, Bob, I like being able to turn it on, have a digital display to know I'm locked in at the frequency I want. I don't have to connect it to my signal counter and make sure I've got, because it's an analog display that I'm on the right frequency or wait the 15 minutes for it to warm up and stabilize. Um, you know, I like being able to turn mm -hmm. it on and just go. So, okay, Dan, your your picture is dark. Did you run out of whale oil or what? <laughs> no, I, I turned it off to try and save yeah. some of the the yeah. bandwidth in here. So, that, I think because it, it kicked me off and I got back on. Yeah, I think that's that's what you so. needed to do. Sorry, we can't see your so. smile. Face. Um, I won't. I, I I I won't apologize for not breaking your computer monitors with my ugly mug. So. All right. What about, um, uh, again, in terms of the ph philosophies, what about um, um, checking capacitors and resistors versus replacing them? Um, I think uh, somebody mentioned uh, U.S. versus uh, Chinese caps, uh, film versus carbon comp resistors, that kind of stuff. Uh, comments on that? As far as I'll, I'll lead off again with it. <clears throat> um, as far as replacing it during a restoration, uh, I have to go back to my original, you know, uh, point. I don't want to ever see this thing back on my bench, which means that everything gets replaced. I'm, as far as I could, I won't say that everything, but 99% of the stuff changes. You know, I'll go through and it gets recapped. And that's all of it. Any resistor that's more than probably 20% out of range gets replaced. Uh, the, you know, the ones you can't do anything with would be transformers, you know, yokes, coils and the like, unless they're already broken or shorted or burned open. Um, but and that's it. I just don't want to see them back. So I want them replaced as far as what which ones to buy. I've been using the the, the good old yellow ones for years. Um, electrolytics have mostly been, you know, Panasonic and the like and uh, stuff like that. And I've probably had less than uh, half a percent of bad ones out of the box they just you know they just don't go bad i don't test them before i put them in uh it just takes up too much time to do it for the failure rate that i've seen in the last you know years i've worked with them uh, and the other thing is to try to find <clears throat> one of the other problems i ran into with and you guys probably did too is you know, you're working on a seven inch set uh, It's packed chassis and they're trying to jam orange drops in it. 
you know, and it's like, holy shit, you know, I look at the underneath the <laughs> chassis and it's like the caps are hanging all over the place because you can't put them back anywhere near where they were. Yeah. So the littler the cap, the better uh, is what, it, you know, as long as they meet the spec, that's what goes into the thing. And that's what I use for them. Costs, you know, I, I use the cost only because I do customer work. And the, no matter where you go, unless you really get into some of the real crazy capacitors that are online, some of the big houses, they're all within, you know, 10% of the price range. Uh, you know, and you, you can buy caps that cost you 50 bucks a piece. Uh, I don't think I'd ever buy it, no matter if it was in the original piece of a test. This had to be in test equipment. The original test equipment piece had a $50 cap. I'll be damned if I'm going to put a $50 cap back in there. <laughs> I'll just wait for it to burn up again and be done with it. So I see you shaking your head there too, Bob. <laughs> oh yeah, no, again, I agree with everything you said. Yeah, that's what I say, Dave. I think you. For some reason, I don't ever want to see anything come back. Yeah, Dave. I think Dave picked three guys yeah. that, that go along with each other instead of getting the devil's advocate in there. Yet, I like to think it's because we we have experience doing this, and this we've all reached the same conclusion for the same reason. Yeah, exactly. We need to get some dissenting opinions. Yeah. Well, I, I've seen some questions coming flying by, and I'd like to address some of those. So, reforming caps. The only time I ever leave old caps in or try to reform them is if it's mine, because I can keep an eye on it, and I know what to look for, and I can jump in and turn it off. I would never... I just can't. I can't leave a 60-year-old capacitor and give it back to a customer, because I... I don't want to to deal with it. I do have a question for the guys that are doing it. Do you carry? I did. I started this years ago. Do you carry a insurance rider for your work that you do? In case you send a, you know, worst case scenario, you send a uh, you send a Philco TV back out, Bob, and the guy plugs it in, and one of two things happens. One is the guy's an idiot. He electrocutes himself off of it. Number two is it shorts, burns down the house. You know damn well you're going to get called in on it because that's just the way me people are anymore. So, yeah. you know, I that's did. That's the big thing I worry about. Yeah. So 25 years ago, I went out and bought a million dollar umbrella. It cost me, mm. I don't know, $100 a year or something like that. It's just a rider on my insurance. I've never had to use it, but it's like, you know, uh, just one of those things. It's like, yeah, okay, well, I've never used my most of my uh, car insurance either, or my house insurance. But it's nice to know that if the house gets destroyed, it's going to be rebuilt. And I really don't need to see uh, somebody knocking on my door and serving me with papers that I killed somebody. So, what's the status on anybody else that does this kind of work? I don't, but I should. Um, when I started doing it, it was mostly for friends. Yeah people who live near me and it was just a handshake and a verbal agreement. Uh, but I'm starting to do more and more paperwork, giving people breakdowns of the work that was done and all that. So that's something I thank you for bringing it up. Cause that's something I should definitely look into. I see that some of the people here, yeah, are saying no, here. And others are saying yes. Uh, but you know, it's just, it's just my personal opinion. The cost of the insurance is so small that it just gets buried in with everything else. So, uh, you know, I haven't seen it hasn't impacted any part of the repair business or my regular household business either. So I do it. So, but I see there's a couple of people here. Yes. And no's. So I guess it's the way it goes until you get burned. Uh, I'll give you an example. I recently restored a 1948 RCA TV, an AT, AT, AT 241. Uh -huh. All it worked fine on all the original electrolytics. <laughs> I just did it for fun, just to see what yep. would happen. It works great. Later, I started taking them out. I tested them. They all test terrible, yep. horrible leakage, even just 100 volts. So, yeah, it worked. If I was selling it, I could have told it somebody, hey, it restored. It works great. Reality is not for long, probably. Yeah, well, what happens, to, I've had it happen to me where I, you know, you do one of these sets, and it, it one of the biggest things I get is, people with pre-war TVs. Now, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that I can't replace because the stuff doesn't exist. Okay, CRTs in particular, a lot of the internals on those things, the caps, resistors, they can be replaced and no problem. But 
the first thing these people want to do is, oh, this is going to be my daily viewer. Say, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, you want to watch it, watch it, show it off for, you know, an hour or something every few days. That's fine. But do not sit and turn it on like your home TV and leave it run. Uh, it's just, it's going to, something's going to fail. Yeah. It. I mean, I've had it happen to me too. Yeah. I've also almost got my head knocked off with an exploding uh, can capacitor one time. It went off and put a hole in my my ceiling uh, that I was in front of when it went off. So it's like, yeah, don't trust any of that stuff. No matter what people say, uh, it goes. I don't I don't mess with them at all either. I saw some questions about restuffing. Yep. Now and then I will if it's a rare <laughs> set, if it's my own, just yep. just to to do it and say that I've done it. Uh, I will not do it for a customer. Well, I do it for customers if they're willing to pay <laughs> twenty bucks per capacitor, <laughs> and I'll, I'll stuff the caps for them. And usually, I've only had two people so far. One was a TRK nine; it was beautiful condition, and another a TRK twelve or. Now my sets, my pre-wars, they're all restuffed. That's just because they were mine. Sure. You know, I didn't really care, you know, what it was. So <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, for me. Don't. What's that? Yeah, for me, I usually I usually don't bother unless I don't physically have the room to put the caps underneath. And I've had um, I think it was a Magnavox 12 inch chassis that just it was packed in that area. So it had a cardboard top, so I could just pop the cardboard off, cut the can off, put the uh, uh -huh. put the new caps in there, and then pop the uh, the cardboard over it and hide it, and it worked fine. Mm. Yeah, I'm talking really. I'm talking yeah. doing the restuffing the paper caps inside those things too. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I and that's why I said very few people want to do it uh, because <laughs> and, uh, like I said, I'm, the heat gun, and... <laughs> but I'm not doing it without cha charging because it takes to cut them out correctly so that you can reuse like some of the leads you can, because you want to get perfect with it and all that good stuff. By the time you get done, you're into it for, you know, almost an hour per capacitor in the damn thing. Sure. And so it's like, it's just not worth my time to do it unless you're willing to pay for it. And that's what I do with them. I, so, I make YouTube videos on my projects and every time I do it, Half the people tell me I'm an idiot and I'm wasting my time. <laughs> and the other half say that's the way it sh everything should be done and good job. Well, the problem is that if, you know, in, in the, in the, one of the old, you know, the old, the old thing, if you've been around, you go through a lot of people. As soon as you unsolder a component, you've destroyed its originality, period. Mm -hmm. So it's like in one philosophy, it's okay, why would you bother restuffing them? when you've already killed the, the originality of the thing. And I've done it in the past too. I've done some, I've done some televisions that I wish I had never, you know, actually never restored them truthfully. And towards the end, the last few pre-wars that I bought, I never even bothered to restore them mainly because I said, I already know what these things look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't want to watch one of these five inchers. I don't want to watch another 12 AP four screen. I just leave it alone. You know, I turn it on, make sure the CRT lights up for a few minutes, and that's it. It gets shut off again, and then up on the shelf it goes, and that's it. You know, early on, yeah, I used to restore every one of them that came through here, <clears throat> but uh, you know, and, and then they'd sit there for three, four, five years, and never even turn them on again. And back to your earlier point too about I like to use smaller parts as well. Uh huh. It was kind of freeze things up. You get better air circulation. You can yep. see the wiring. You can see what's going on better. Yep. Uh, I think it makes them more reliable. Or, oh, yeah. If you can get the heat out of them, you definitely have a, a good chance of doing that, keeping things alive. Um, uh, along you know, the lines of keeping it original with restuffing, resistors are kind of hard to track down. <laughs> yeah, you can't really do it. I've, I've, in a couple of sets I've done, early stuff again, and they had dog bones in them or something like that. I've taken resistors and hidden them underneath where the cat where the resistor is going to sit. So when you open it up, if you really want to look, it's like you can't see them because they're they're on the other side of the resistor. Move the resistor, you can see there's a new one in there. But uh, you know, it was just okay. I've gone so far as to put uh, plumber's putty around modern resistors <laughs> to make them, them to look like a dog bone. <laughs> 
when I was single. <laughs> so, uh, don't have quite so much free time. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. So uh, oh, and then one of the uh, briefly about restuffing caps. Uh, just recently, I got somebody telling me about uh, I'm going to kill myself because of yeah. all the cancer causing agents that I've now released yeah. into my house. Yeah. And I've just shortened the lifespan of all of my family members. And, and he was serious. He says he rebuilds amplifiers. He's a professional. He knows what he's talking about. He has a special hazmat <laughs> dumpster where all the old caps come. And every month he pays a disposal fee. And, uh, well, I don't know where he is. I started get... <laughs> Yeah. For me anymore, I look at it this way. I've spent three quarters of my life already doing it. The rest of it, life is not going to be any worse than I've already been through. The cadmium, the lead, the asbestos. Yeah, yeah we're yeah, still I here. I, <laughs> play, I play with the asbestos. I just make sure it's soaking wet when I find a piece and pull it out. Cadmium, yeah, yeah. I'll wipe yep. it down with something enough to keep the dust down. But there's not much else you can really do with this stuff. Yeah. Unless you want to gar you know, garb up. But then big deal. So you garbed up for it, but you're, now you're turning this thing over to somebody else. Still got the yeah. dust on it. I've noticed more and more guys are wearing gloves when they work on this stuff. Yeah. I can't. I can't either. Don't feel bad. I can't work with <laughs> that. Drives yeah, me crazy. I, I, I need the dexterity of my fingers. I just I right. hate wearing gloves. Yep. <laughs> but I get a lot of comments about that, the, the toxicity, and you should be wearing gloves. No. Oh, hell, Sorry. The, the, what we touch in everyday life, right. <laughs> I'm not worried about yeah. the not me neither. TV or radio. <laughs> so, um, Chuck, you started to, to uh, allude to this. You're talking about you don't ever want to see uh, a set come back to right. you. Um, let's talk for a minute about repair versus restoration. And um, I, the reason I, uh, I thought of this is that there is a fella here in New Jersey, uh, an old repair guy mm -hmm. who does repairs and uh, he, for, he'll repair any TV for a hundred bucks. He's got a flat rate price for, uh, to repair a TV. But when you bring your TV into him, he finds the capacitor, the that yeah. failed, snips it out, puts a new one in and gives you your TV back in working condition. Um, that just doesn't seem to be a real great philosophy on, uh, oh, yeah. on a 70 year old set. But yeah. where do you draw the line? Like you said, you, you'll you test the resistors. Um, you know, wh wh where do we draw the line between uh, what, you know, what constitutes a full restoration? Uh, how far would you go towards, uh, you know, doing a, uh, a budget job maybe versus somebody for whom price is no object, et cetera, et cetera? Basically ask the customer. I've gone the same thing. When they bring it in here, I basically, my whole model is a restoration. Okay, just what I told you. All the caps get changed out. Resistors over a certain number. And usually it's, like I said, usually it's 20% it's I use as a limit for the first time through them. Now, again, 20% some circuits is out of whack. And you'll find that out when you go test the set and make sure it's going to work. Tubes, shorted tubes, you know, uh, they get replaced. Tubes that check sort of weak, I put them back in. If the set uh, under testing, you find, oh, there's not enough gain here or not enough color there or whatever. Then you change the tubes out to do that. Um, it, and I do have some people that just want it working. And there I just basically go along with us. If all you want me to do is fix it, I'll just fix it. But this is, you know, you run the risk of it's going to fail in a week, in a month. It's going to go. And it's, there are some that I've just said no, you know. You know, what they want done was just not worth the aggravation of having it come back to me or, you know, an idiot just saying, oh, yeah, well, it's your fault. You were the last one that worked on it. You've, you've got to fix it, even though it's some completely isolated piece that burned, burned out. It's still your fault. Right. Well, Dan was making some comments about, you know, managing customer expectations. So maybe yeah. a time yeah. we can jump into that, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I recall back when I was a kid, I mean, even when the sets were brand new or were just two or three years old, uh, the TV repair guy would fix it. And, you know, then a week, a month later, it was broken again. And, uh, you know, that was uh, just how things rolled. So, uh, had, had, Dan, you want to you want to jump into that since you uh, you brought that yeah. up? Yeah. Yeah. The um, I, I used to always refer to 
the Radiola guy's website. I don't know if it's back up or not, but he used to have a page or two about um, operating a vintage television set in the modern world. And um, I would direct people to that and said, you know, here's why the sound isn't what you're expecting, or here's why you're seeing little weird things in the picture, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, like he brings up the point, you know, there's so much stuff crammed into broadcast signals now, you know, closed captioning, channel information, blah, blah, blah. And they've managed to cram all that into the, you know, the waveform for the carrier. But these old sets weren't designed to handle that extra information in the signal. So they don't know what to do with it. So it shows up as interference or something weird on the, uh, on the screen. So there's that. Um, and then, like you say, the frequency of when these things would break down, um, you know, and hey, this, there's certain parts in here that are essentially unobtainium. So if you keep running the set, uh, you know, if they have a finite life. So I'll lead off with those thoughts, but I'm sure the other guys have some other perspectives as well. Yeah, I, uh, I try to set customers' expectations right up front and say, hey, I will do X, Y, Z, replace the caps, check the tubes. Tubes are kind of go back and forth on. Lately, I've just been putting in all new tubes just because I have a good supply now and I don't want to deal with it. But I keep all the used tubes. Sometimes I'll give them to the owner and say, hey, generally, and generally with the caps too, I save everything I clip out. I give them a bag and say, hey, <laughs> here's the history of your set, you know. Um, but I tell them, hey, I can, the only guarantee I can give you is when you pick it up, it's working. And, and here's what I did. Uh, generally, I could, I have an it sets come back. It will probably keep working for a while. And I tell people to use it sparingly, not, as like you said, not, not all, don't leave it playing all day, every day. Uh, and so far, that's worked out pretty well. And everybody has been very understanding. I said, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, I, I know there are no guarantees. It's 70 years old. And uh, so far, I haven't had any trouble with people being upset that, they, hey, it's, it's five years later and it's not working anymore. And you said it would work forever. And <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> things will keep going that way. Yeah, I don't, I don't really give them a warranty on time limits. It's just that I warrant the work that I did. And the parts yeah. that I replace. Yeah. If yeah. it's something other than that, it's like you brought it in to me fresh. And they I, have give no idea. Itemized, I give them an itemized bill when they pick it up that's itemized for every resistor, every capacitor, and every usually everything that I've done in the set as part of the uh, you know the bill. And then so there's no question then because I've got a copy of it. They have a copy of it. If he comes back mm -hmm. a year later, says it stopped working, and I go into it and find you know, this other, you know, transformer burned out because of some crazy thing. It's like, I can't help that. If the capacitor I put in shorted out and burnt the transformer out, then yeah, okay, I will make good on it. And most of that is just, you know, the old, sat, you know, good business again. You, you, what you're looking for is uh, the guy's likely to bring your name up when he says, oh, you know, I got somebody that does the work for you. It'll do it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, so it costs a few bucks maybe, but it's uh, it's not been a killer. When it gets to that point, I'll stop doing it, period. Does anybody so have a deal with a good customers business. monkeying around in the set and trying to fix it? Or... Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that that voids everything. That's just the same way <laughs> as everybody else. Mm. Uh, like with some of my really prized televisions are I'm not going to restore them or start replacing capacitors because I look at it like this. It's mine for the next, say, 30, 40 years or so, and then it'll belong to someone else. And it's going to just keep getting handed on down to different people. And eventually there'll come a time when these sets will not be able to function no matter what, because of, yeah. you know, windings breaking down and transformers, picture tubes, availability. So I look at it like this. The future generations that are going to appreciate these at the point where they're no longer functional are going to say, look, I got a set full of new parts. I think that the uh, 
the set that's been unmolested and unrestored will be more valuable and more collectible a hundred years from now than uh, the one that's been restored. I agree with you hundred percent. That's always been a story for 25 years is you get the people that say the same thing. Why are you going to mm -hmm. restore it? It's going to be worth more money if it's not been touched. And it's like, yeah, okay. I believe it on, on some sets. I don't have a problem with some, some TVs, some radios, you're better off leaving it alone. Just use it as I call them a shelf queen. It shows the period, everything is there. But what do you do with, uh, you know, a common radio or TV? They made a hundred thousand of them. Fix yeah. it up and use it. What's that? You fix it up and use it, you know? Yeah, but so I say you can fix that up. And, but at some point it's like, yeah, is it worth even fixing? I, I get sets in that really, truthfully, my, one of my favorite customers is the one that comes in. It's a family heirloom. Yep. Those people are fantastic. They don't care what it costs, yeah. what you have to do. Yep. Yep. Just fix it. I just had, I've had p things come in. I just had a radio, console radio shipped from Hawaii to me. <laughs> I tried to talk this woman out of it for days. She just absolutely said, no, I want you to restore it. It's like, God, you imagine what it's going to cost to ship it to me? You know, I said, nobody in the West Coast? Nope. And nobody in Hawaii? Nope. So I said, fine, ship it. I said, I'll get it done. It'll probably be, you know, maybe this spring it'll be finished. You know, that, but that's just the way it is. I've had them, a few of them from the West Coast. Luckily, no televisions from the West Coast. Um, uh, that one there, I, I don't even want to ship them back. So that's my biggest reason for me to <laughs> not take them is because I don't want to ship them. That's a good topic, by the way. Uh, generally, I say, if you want me to fix it, you have to bring it to my front door uh, for televisions. Yeah. I, a couple of people have broke me down and they pulled the chassis out and shipped it to me. Now, shipping is a hassle. I mean, in and of itself is a hassle, but they have to then, when they get it back, yeah. They have to put reassemble it and connect everything back up right and adjust it right. Yeah, they'll trust some, them to know how to do yeah. it. Some people you you can't do it with. I've got I've a, I have one stand one regular customer in Alabama and he's into pre-war stuff. So he's okay. He can plug everything back together again when I send him. But the problem was, you know, shipping the thing. I gotta build a crate, a wooden crate yeah. to ship this thing and make sure that it gets <laughs> back to him okay. Right. And, you know, the cost on it, I think the cost of the TRK-12 chassis was, God, over a hundred and some dollars for that. The power supply was even worse. Yeah, imagine. It. And then the wood and the bolts and everything else to put it all together. I, I did have a guy one time ship to me a, a um, 1F5, a pre-war Andrea 1F5. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, from uh, Washington up to here. And he crated this thing up. It was a beautiful job, you know, to do it. And again, it was one of these jobs that money was no object. He didn't really care. He just wanted it completely redone. So the cabinet, the cabinet was more money than my restoration fee. That's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot more. Uh, but that's the way they they go with it. It's It's just, sometimes it's just funny to talk to these people. But yeah, that, I agree with you 100%. If they could deliver it, I much prefer to deliver it and pick it up because I don't really want to, uh, I don't really like the idea of repacking. And a lot of times the packing they ship it in, it didn't survive. It barely survived the first trip. Right, right. You know, unless they do Kratom, but that's rare. So. Yeah, speaking of rare, um, as far as I know, we are very rare people. <laughs> I mean, in terms of people yes. that actually fix up old TVs, yeah, uh, I think there were only I don't know, a dozen of us in this country. Yeah, there's, there's not something. many that do any kind of repair, good repair work on early stuff. Period. I'll tell you, it's uh, no some work <laughs> by people. People brought me some stuff, and it's like, where'd you find this guy? You know, wires oh, are oh man, parts are connected <laughs> together, flying in underneath the <laughs> chassis. They, you know. And then the I, ones that they glue them inside, they, they're hot glued inside the chassis. I think we've all seen too many of those. I mean, I it, it wasn't a it wasn't a TV per se, but I've seen in radios a lot of that. Um, somebody had brought one in Northern, said, "Oh yeah, I, I bought it from this you know repair shop," and they said it works, but 
you guys go through it. And, you know, of course they had their, their big sticker slapped on the back with their yeah. phone number and everything. And I open it up and, you know, there's some inductors in the filament string to keep the AC interference down while they were open. So they just soldered jumpers across them. Uh, there was the, uh, they grafted some kind of pilot light in there with this huge dropper resistor. It was just <laughs> flopping around in the breeze. And it's like, guys, that bulb is still available readily. Why did you go through all this trouble to <laughs> put this contraption together to do it? And I mean, there must've been three or four other things in there. And all there's old original paper caps in there and stuff. Um, you know, just, I thought, man, if this was me, I wouldn't let this out my front door with my name plastered all over it. But um, you know, I, I've, <laughs> taken apart other radios and seen all kinds of crazy stuff so i'm sure we all have at one point yeah that's one of the big reasons why i started doing this for other folks is i was contacted by one guy in particular he had gone to two other repair shops and spent hundreds of dollars over several years trying to get just a basic admiral tv working and he came to me out of desperation and i said fine just bring it to me and they had hardly done anything. And they told him that there's a, it couldn't be fixed. It turned out to be a with coil that needed to get replaced. I didn't even charge him because I felt bad for the guy. It spent somebody five hundred dollars to fix just a basic one of the mill Admiral TV, and it was a family heirloom. That's yeah. all he wanted was his one black and white old TV to work. Uh, and I've seen that before because I've gotten. Or I've been given sets that they said it just can't be fixed if you want it for parts. And they handed me the inventory and I was shocked at what they were charged for basically having no work done. For example, a picture tube evaluation, 50 bucks, yeah. which means they just hooked up to a CRT test or if they even, even, if they if even they did even that. <laughs> Jeez. It took me five minutes to get the set working. And he said it was a set that they couldn't be fixed and he'd spent hundreds of dollars trying to get it. Uh, Anybody? I uh, had, I had an interesting one. Oh, sorry, Dave. No, go ahead. Go. You're the you're the panel. Go right ahead. No, this this kind of this kind of plays in, you know, with the museum and everything. And I know Bob's heard me tell this story before, but there was a person there at one of the conventions a few years back. Um, she was there with her son because her son was really interested in televisions, and he had a little seven-inch electrostatic admiral. And she had taken it to a local shop and they got it working, uh, which is a fairly loose term for some people. But uh, she said, yeah, you turn it on and within five minutes, the picture starts to collapse and other bad things happen. She said, you know, could you look at it? And she had brought it with her. And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to look at it. And, uh, you know, by luck, a couple of weeks later, I'd be going right by where they lived in Indiana for work. So I said, I can uh, take it and go through it. And when I opened the thing up, um, you know, there's maybe three resistors that had been replaced, a couple of electrolytics, and that was it. I mean, even the big 6,000 volt coupling caps for the deflection plates were still the originals. So it was no surprise that it, uh, was behaving like that but so went through went through all the caps checked the resistors did all that stuff got the set working pretty well but the vertical wouldn't lock so i kept going through it and you know, i'm checking all these parts and it's like i've gone through everything in the vertical section what the heck could be going on and there was this huge domino cap in there and micas typically don't go bad but when I was reading in the parts list, it was originally specified as a paper capacitor. And looking closer, it looked like it had just been tacked in by some repairman, I don't know how, you know, how many decades ago. And I thought, well, what are the chances? I'll pop it out and put a new film cap in there and bam, vertical locked in. Sound was great. You know, the, that was the final piece. So even things that you think are going to be you know, okay, you still got to check. And never believe in those, mm -hmm. Never believe that, that a mica cap is good either. Yeah, especially Save in yourself the aggravation. <laughs> uh, they're 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 bad. Most the truth, 
most modern films are almost as good as the micas from 65 yeah. 70 years ago i mean yeah. you gotta be you know i i wouldn't replace a mica that was in a uh tuned circuit you know oscillate or something like that with a film but any other place that there was a mica cap i don't even bother with them anymore just put a film in it and it works i rebuilt mm -hmm. just to give you an idea about everybody says about one thing i, I get a kick out of is listening i don't know how many of you listening even run into this but one of the things i see is people asking for where can i buy a 0.013 cap um because that's what this one required it's like you cringe because it's like put an 01 in it put an 015 in it i rebuilt a radio one day with all 0.03 caps in it except for the filters of course but every coupling cap every bypass cap in it was a 0.03 radio worked like a charm and basically it boils down to you know the engineer designs a thing the, the the bean counter looks at it and says, we don't have those and we're not going to buy them. I have a hundred thousand of these. <laughs> this is what you're going to put into it. Yeah. And you end up. Well, and also. You also think about the tolerances of the parts compared yeah. to then versus now. Oh yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Someone's yeah. like, well, I got a 50 microfarad filter. I, I can't put a 47 in there. Well, yeah, but if you if you look at 20% of 50 and then the 10% of a modern one, you're still falling within that tolerance range. So look, you really you don't have the, anything to worry about. You ever look at the specs on a can cap? They're plus 100 minus 50%. <laughs> right, terrible. Yeah. You know, it's like put anything you want into it. It's like right. I, I, whatever I see laying around, if the voltage is bigger or equal, and that's what I've got on my bench, that's what goes into the thing. I mean, I, yeah, you, you don't have a problem with them. Don't put them, you know, the old adage used to be never double the cap or half the cap. <laughs> but, you know, and I think it's probably a good run of the mill rule to go with uh, just to keep it safe. But, but again, it's like the tolerances, like, you know, whoever was said about it, tolerances anymore are crazy. What used to be precision today is normal. Yeah, I cringe yeah. when I see guys on various online forums and they're stuck on some problem where they have no image or something. And they say, well, I better go through and check all the resistors and make sure they're all within 5%. Like, <laughs> dude, we have a major problem. Like you don't have a raster or something. It's not going to be because the resistor is 10% off. It's you have a major problem. Yeah. You have a, a bad connection. You have, you know, ah, anyways. Yeah, I've seen one, oh, hey, one unit came forget. in one time. The guy put all 1% resistors in. <laughs> And it goes back Jeez. to that about matching two characteristics and stuff. But yeah. These, well, these circuits were designed worse. with huge yeah. tolerance range. And you, you get the uh, the audio amps, the same thing happens to those when you see those. I've seen those, same thing. The guy puts a, puts 1% resistors in. And it's like, I'm sorry, that's <laughs> still not going to make it sound any better. How about outside foil on a capacitor? Yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> Something I get asked about. <laughs> I don't, uh, sorry, I just, I I know it's there and I know it has some bases, <laughs> but I've never had a problem putting one in backwards, so to no, speak, no, or yeah, backwards. Yeah. <laughs> I will, there in are a very high gain, stuff we've talked about. In a very high gain preamp stage, I could see where you might have a, an issue with it, but I've never seen the, that big of a high gain stage outside of a piece of instrument. Exactly. And that's Maybe. been my philosophy too. If it's something that's that sensitive, it's probably going to be in a shielded box. Yeah, that too. Exactly. <laughs> I may do a YouTube video on this topic at some point, knowing that it's going to elicit a lot of response. <laughs> oh, just yeah. because certain people who have, there are certain other YouTubers who have many, many followers and they say something that's just taken as gospel, like outside foil matters. And then everybody just says, well, oh, I guess it matters. And they, I get asked that all the time, especially if I'm troubleshooting something. Don't you make sure you put your caps in the right way? Matter. <laughs> yeah. But so and so says it does matter. I don't care. You haven't gotten enough hate mail, Bob, I guess. Hey, you need to get some more. 
See, the good thing about me, I don't, I don't even get on that shit anymore. I give up. I, I don't. It's just like I don't really want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Something like this yeah. is so bad. Dave talked me into doing this, but I'm thinking, and here I'm <laughs> dealing with, you know, guys that basically know what they're doing. Hopefully, but uh, you get out on those freelance forums. This God only knows, and you got just the people that just want to irritate and start a, a, a flaming everybody. So yeah. I, I don't buy it. you want you want some information? I'll be glad to talk to you one on one. Is where it goes to, and that's it. Let me let me ask yeah. a question here. Um, the, I heard uh, comments ranging from uh, Bob fixed the set for free for somebody that had already right. put too much money into it. To uh, Chuck has had people come to him, uh, and basically it was uh, how much you got, <laughs> and, uh, and everything <laughs> in between. Um, th this this can be a kind of a third rail topic, but uh, does anybody want to talk about what is a uh, a reasonable, uh, uh, fair and reasonable charges for different levels of service, and um, and 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 what do you do if a set comes in and it's way worse than you thought it was before you quoted a price to somebody? I never quote a price. That's you know I, I give it a range by going back. What I'll do is I'll go back on my into my billing software and I'll pull invoices for the, the closest TV or radio, whatever, over the past few years, and I'll take an average of what that costs. That's the number I give them with, you know, I'm not being held by it, but there's a rough idea of where it is. Uh, it could come in under, it could come up a lot. And you always have the same thing. This is all um, based on standard replacements. Power transformers, no. That's out off the books because if I have to have one made, I know it's going to be 200 bucks to have one made. Picture tubes, God only knows, especially if you're dealing with pre-wars, you could be out three, 4,000 bucks for a pre-war picture tube if you can find one. All that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, there's a standard, at least in my case, I, there's a standard repair work that's done that I can give you a rough idea what it is. And that's how I leave it. And if you Oh, and basically, in my <laughs> so, sorry to say it this way, but what I end up with is uh, you called me. I'm giving you a price. If you don't like it, go find somebody else to do it. <laughs> I don't need it. That's that's the main thing. Is this this isn't my livelihood? You know, it's yeah, and that's that's an interesting thing. Is I think we're all in the same boat where it's not we don't it's not our main source of income and. We have the ability to turn people away. And yeah. I do. I've had people who want to flip a set and they want me to do, oh, just just, just make it yeah, work. Just make it work. It. Yeah. I said, no, yeah. <laughs> this is what I do. This is what it will cost. Yes or no. I'll make it work for you. If you know those part, but those people, it's okay. What's the restore? $400? I'll get it working for $400. <laughs> you know? But by the way, since you threw that number out, that is my base yeah. charge. I've been getting more and more to itemizing. Yeah, of course, if it's a picture tube or anything like that, then it's going to be significantly more. But that is about what my base yeah. uh, estimate yeah. is for getting to be over 400 bucks. That's for me. And, you know, I, I just kind of use a flat rate for, okay, basic rebuild. This is what it's going to take. And then, you know, I just have the caveat if it needs a flyback or a picture tube or some oddball part, then, you know, we have to. We got to come back to the table and talk more. Hey, speaking of question. show and tell time, you guys can see this. I don't know if it's backwards or oh, not. Yeah. <laughs> the 1952 price list for pitcher tubes. Multiply those values by 30 to adjust for inflation. To get some <laughs> idea. The 7JP4 1952 is 25 bucks. That would be uh, $750 in today's money. Mm. TVs were really expensive back then. <laughs> Tubes were really expensive. Just to give some idea. So uh, picture tubes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people say they're expensive now, but actually they're cheaper now than they were back then if you judge just for inflation. So now we know why they sold so many brighteners back then. <laughs> exactly. And why people spend money to get them rebuilt. <laughs> yep. So Dan, you were also also talking a little bit about uh, 
uh, customers who had uh, uh, not necessarily unrealistic expectations, but uh, unreasonable fears, uh, fear of uh, x-ray. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the people <laughs> yeah. who think it just needs a tube, just change a tube. And, uh, you know. you know, that one you're going to hear in any any hobby oh it just needs a tube or you know if it's an old record player it probably just needs a needle or a, or a idler wheel and it'll be fine no 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 but you know there is that stigma of old televisions like i'll tell people i'm you know i've worked on them and oh man the you, you didn't get killed by the radiation off of that and that's you know guys <laughs> you know, i start to explain some of the physics of it it's like a black and white set it's not generating enough you know, anode voltage to pull the electrons fast enough to have them give off radiation when they hit something and a black and white TV, there's no shadow mask for them to hit. So, you know, everyone likes to mention the famous GE sets in the late sixties that, Oh, you know, we were calling the shunt regulator tubes because the circuit had a problem with it. Yeah. But you had to be sitting at just the right spot by the TV a certain distance away to even get any soft x-ray exposure to it. So, you know, there's that perception. Um, some people I've had people ask me, are you going to put all new tubes in it? And I said, well, I can, if you want to, but they're asking because their perception is tubes go bad just from sitting. And usually that's not the case. I mean, if their vacuum is intact and the envelope hasn't been damaged, then, you know, they should be okay. I'll go through and I'll test them to make sure that the filaments aren't open or things like that. But as was said earlier, uh, the set's the best teacher, or, or I should say the, uh, the best tester, because a teaching experience I had from that, I was doing a Sylvania halo light for a lady. It was her dad's TV. He even had a plaque with his name on the top of it. So I think he worked for Sylvania. And I don't know if they gave that to him as a retirement gift or, or what, but it had value to her. So I go through, I'm testing the tubes and the vertical output tube tested marginal. So I got a replacement, put it in there, get the set up and running. And the vertical is maybe only going three quarters of the, the height of the, the CRT. And I've got the linearity turned all the way up, the height turned all the way up, and it is just really lacking. So I go in and I'm checking all the two voltages and everything's dead on where it should be. And I thought, well, what the heck, let's put this other tube back in. And I put the original quote unquote weak tube in there. And now I had tons of raster. I'm having to dial everything mm -hmm. back to pull the picture back into its, uh, you know, into the mask there. And uh, that's when I learned that Raytheons were junk tubes. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, I, you know, it worked fine in that set. So um, yeah, it's, it's for tube replacement, it's kind of a tightrope walk because in some cases, critical circuits, you want them new. So again, you don't want the thing coming back. But at the same time, if the tube is working well in the set, I don't see a, a need to replace it. Um, I'm trying to think of other misconceptions people have had. Um, I don't know. Did I list any other ones in that note to you, Dave? Well, yeah, you, you had talked about, um, I guess, the um, you, you, you had started to touch on uh, maybe people who... Um, who who will take a set and hook it up to an antenna and then and then oh right yeah or yeah, conversely the people who seem to have all the answers and they say oh yeah these sets will never work again uh, there's no way you can make them work again yeah yeah that's the one I forgot the um you know with the whole digital changeover people thought oh well my TV's obsolete now I can't I got to throw it away because you know it'll never work again with broadcast no you get a converter box and put it on there. Um, that could lead its lead to its own discussion because some converter boxes are better than others. I had one that was one of the, the freebies with the coupon from the FCC when they changed over and I would get terrible buzzing problems in the audio. And it turned out it was the converter box. I got a, a much better, you know, higher end one and I never had nearly the problems with it. So you know, I usually give people advice as to what one they should try to buy um, for using with their set. But 
I mean, sometimes it even just comes down to people again, because they don't know. They'll look at the back of the TV and they'll see the screw terminals for the, the, uh, the antenna and say, well, I can't connect a coax to it. Well, yeah, you get a matching transformer. I mean, to us, it's, it's trivial, but to them, they don't know. So yeah, it's, you come across some interesting arguments from people, uh, either just because they're misinformed or, you know, somebody puts something in their head that they, like you say, oh, somebody said this, so it's gospel. Eh, not necessarily. What I hear now and then is about the, uh, well, burn your house down or they overheat. And I see people go so far as to cut a hole in the back of sets and put fans inside of them. Oh, yeah. Especially with the yeah. predictors. Which, <laughs> well, the, yeah, tubes uh, get hot. I mean, if, you, if you're not... Yeah. If you haven't seen tubes before, you, you might be thrown off by how much heat they kick out. But that's their normal operation. They, 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 but yeah. another thing, too, is, you know, the parts that we're using to rebuild these sets, you know, the temperature ratings are higher now. I mean, oh, yeah. I think what the average for most electrolytics or regular caps is around 105 C. And most of these sets, when they were new, 85 C was considered the high end. Um you know, right. we put in film resistors that don't drift with temperature. You know, there's, you know, you, you rebuild a predict and now with modern parts, you can turn that thing on. You never have to futz with the horizontal hold, the vertical hold. It'll lock <laughs> right in. Um, I had a guy that I restored one for and he says, man, this thing is great because it, it had worked. Somebody had done some restoration work on it when he got it and he was a TV collector. So again, like you said, Bob, you kind of know what to watch for when you have the understanding that you've got a bunch of original parts in there. But uh, he says, man, this is great. I don't have to get up three or four times to fix the hold in that during the course of my program. And so. Yeah, it some things have come a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think we've covered most of the things on the uh, on the list that that I had here. Um, if anybody has any other questions, or if any of you three guys have anything that you want to jump in at, I know Bob, you were talking about all the annoying people on uh, on YouTube. <laughs> I, I I sensed that there were some stories there, but then it, you know when when we uh, when we uh, you know, when that well dries up, there were a lot of questions on the uh, chat. So people should jump in with uh, with those questions maybe uh, at, uh, at some point soon. And maybe we can get some answers to them, too. Yeah, I mean, you want any social media, you're opening yourself up to criticism. So whether it's a forum or Facebook or YouTube or whatever, I got a thick skin early on. And I've, I've started out some videos many times or at least i used to and saying like i don't have all the answers there's more than one way to do it as you said restoration versus repair whatever this is what i am going to do for this project because i choose to and then i still get comments that's <laughs> why are you doing it that way or wasting your time or you should have done this or should have done that oh, you got a pretty friendly I should ignore them but sometimes i get into it <laughs> and I, I know better but Sometimes it's just hard to ignore the comments and things. I so you never, got a friendly crowd here tonight, so uh, count your blessings. Yeah, which is which is refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> Getting in arguments online never leads to anything productive. <laughs> You're never going to change anybody's mind. <laughs> no, no, it usually devolves into personal insults at some point. So just avoid it if you can. You know, uh, like, really I, like I ended the I did, I did a presentation at the ETF last year. And I ended it by saying, that "Just, just have fun." And I'll say the same thing about this: just do, do, do what you think is satisfying to you and makes your customers happy, and just keep on, keep on keeping on. A rather common question that I'm asked from visitors that look at my collection: they always seem to ask. Do all of these sets work? <laughs> you know, and I say, well, you know, I've got probably, I have at least 120 sets in my collection. And um, I just tell them the same thing. I said, I do have a few representative sets. I said, but what's the point in making them all work? Because I can't watch them all or test them all. <laughs> it would take too long. And plus the fact, you know, that 
once you fix them, you come back a year, two years later, and there's something wrong with them all over again. And all yeah. of that. Well, two, uh, some of you that do know me, I have, for you Predicta guys, I have two Philco Predicta sets, brand new in the box, never opened. <laughs> one's a G4242, and the other one's a 17 -er. But in the 42 there, I cut a little window down in the corner of the set and shined a flashlight up in it just to see what it looked like. Kind of interesting, though, but I've, I've thought about opening up one of the boxes as a ceremony or something, but I'm not <laughs> quite sure how to do that. But what do you guys think I should do with it? Wow, um, that's a tough one. It was exciting a few months ago. Somebody found just a, an empty box from a 17er, and we were all in awe. But it didn't actually have a set inside of it that never been opened. I, I, it's such a rare thing. I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it seems like it shouldn't stay in the box forever because then it doesn't do anybody any good. But yeah, then again, I mean, it's only original once. In some cases, you know, for those of us that you know weren't alive when these sets were brand new it would be helpful to look at okay this is how it came from the factory this is how mm -hmm. the lead dress should be you know things like that so in one hand it would be a great learning tool you know a time capsule per se but again you know the factory you know Philco wasn't around anymore they they sealed the box so um we actually you know the the shop I help out at, they used to sell Philco Predictas back in the day. And, uh, you know, somebody had brought in, you know, they called up the guy and said, hey, I've got this this TV with your card in it for your business. And can I bring it in? And um, the guy, I guess his grandfather had bought it as a gift anniversary present for his wife. And he had it all wrapped up and hid away behind the clothes or something in the closet. And, uh tragically he passed away before he could give it to her and it was hidden away in the house and it sat there for decades and when the son or whoever it was inherited it he's going through cleaning out and he sees this box all wrapped up with the shop's card in the top and so they brought it in and they actually opened it up and he said god i wish i'd taken a video of this because no one would believe it pretty much but they actually got it out of the box. They plugged it in and it worked, even though it sat in the box for decades. Um, they were just amazed. So that's, I, I mean, that, I don't know what, if that gives any kind of perspective, but you know, for the one rare instance where that's happened and someone actually did open it, um, that's a story I can share. There's a, um, a news art I'm, I'm going to read to you guys um, that sort of has some bearing on this from just a few days ago, Monday, February 20th. Sealed original iPhone sells for over $63,000 at auction. Um, it's still in, it's got the plastic <laughs> shrink wrap on it. And apparently, it's it just a paraphrase here. It says the owner was given it as a gift by friends in 2007, but never used it because she had another phone. And she just left it unopened for 15 years. And I guess the thing is, if she ever opens it, it's probably worth a lot. Well, whoever bought it, if you ever opens it, it's probably worth a lot less than 63,000 bucks. That is crazy. The yeah. guy that I bought these sets from, he had a, also a, a Philco Predictive Princess that was new in the box, but he had opened it and uh, he would had it out on display and the thing worked perfectly, it seemed like. I just wish I'd bought it as well, but at the time I wasn't thinking in that direction. I just liked the predictors mm -hmm. themselves. I bought it years ago. I bought a uh, Stromberg Carlson new in the box, also. <clears throat> it had been sealed up. It was a 1949. I don't remember the model, but I opened it up because I just wanted to see what it looks like. Something that hadn't been in the atmosphere, and <clears throat> you know I probably shouldn't done it either. But it was just amazing to see it. A TV chassis that still shined. You know, you could see yourself in the damn thing. And cabinet, you know, the cabinet was actually no alligator on it, pristine everything. So I did save all the packing and everything, packed it all up and put it all back together again. And I, I ended up I ended up giving it away to a friend of mine that uh, collects that stuff also. 
So yeah. I gave it to him as a gift. So so now it sits somewhere in his collection on, on a shelf. <laughs> we, we didn't I touch on this. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't touch on this topic. And I, don't, and I know it's getting late. Don't want to send us down a rabbit hole. But um, when I'm restoring, repairing a quote unquote antique television, as much as I want the RF and the IF to all get you know, swept and tuned and have everything work right. While I'm in there, if it's a set that has a transformer based power supply, I pretty much always put a RCA jacks on the set for direct video input and direct audio input. So you could hook up a DVD player to it because they don't have modulators and don't want to need, don't want to have to use a modulator and really don't want to have to worry about all those RF and IF tubes and you can play a dvd and just go in with you know your red and white and yellow jacks you just mono the left and right together and you just give them the video input right into the right after the video detector before the you know video amplifier so you get all your sync and and it works great but that's probably blasphemy to some people on the call not really it's i've done it a number of times uh uh, in particular, some people, that's the way they want them. And other times, it's just the fact that, you know, <clears throat> uh, we all know 1948 and 49 RCA tuners are pieces of shit. <laughs> exactly. You know, the wafers are gone. So sometimes it's the only way to get one of those sets working again. So there's really Generally, no I don't, but it. I can understand why you would, because the few times I have the picture and the sound is spectacular. But most of my customers want the charm of fiddling around with the dial the tuners, and the picture yeah. not being quite right. It's kind of a weird thing, too. Most of the people I've done work for, they're older folks. And they don't expect the set to work perfectly. They want to <laughs> kind of fiddle with the knobs and have to tune for the charm of it, the nostalgia of it, mm. if you follow me. Yep. So I generally don't put the jacks in. Yeah, that, Bob, that Oops. kind of that kind of brings up you know, when I was alluding to earlier about people, uh, what they expect out of it. I mean, when I first got into the hobby, you know, I'm, I got the TV working pretty well, but you know, there's something kind of funny looking in the picture with that. And then I'm on the forums asking guys, Hey, what's wrong with the set? And nothing. That's the way they were. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I, I didn't grow up with them. I didn't know any better. I, I mean, or cows you know, and lines. Yeah, you look at a you know modern a modern TV, and you know there's on off volume and channel. That's all you right. need. But you know my Admiral thirty A one has you know what eight knobs in the front, another ten in the back, and all that. And people see that and like, good God, how do you even get a picture in on that thing? It's like, well, <laughs> just what you did. Yeah, that was a similar experience for me when I first started with these TVs. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect because I'm not old enough to. I, I always had color TV. I always had solid state TV. I'm 53 years old. Um, so I thought if I got any picture of it, hey, I, that's just how good it got. Until I saw uh, like an RCA 630TS with full 4.5 megahertz bandwidth fully set up right. Like, oh, wow. Okay. You can't actually get a really, really good image on these sets. Generally, then they get into the later sets and they start cutting corners and not quite so good. Actually, if you, uh, it was surprising me, hell on me, a friend gave me a Philco seven inch. And everybody always says they're terrible, you know, pictures mm -hmm. of bandwidth. Ship. I spent basically a full day realigning the thing for them, redoing the whole thing. Uh, <clears throat> I have pictures of the swept response and everything else, but this damn thing just blew my mind when I got done with it because. The, the video bandwidth was out at over four meg. Uh, when you put a you put a display on it, you can. It's like man, this is something else. I don't think I've seen. You know, since looking at a six thirty, you know, you, you expect that you never expect it on a seven inch seven G four <laughs> set. And this thing was so crisp and clean. It was like, and when I gave it back to him. He goes, "This is my same TV." <laughs> but yeah, I said yes, it is. But again, you wouldn't believe what I had to do to make it do that. You know, it was basically a full realignment. 
And mm -hmm. I spent hours on that. And basically my original job was sweeping wide bandwidth RF amplifiers, you know, 200 to 800 megahertz stuff. So, and you, you, it's basically more of an art than it is, you know, you sit there and read the book, you know, even on a TV and it says, oh, adjust this, this, and this. And realistically, those things are so interconnected <laughs> that you adjust this one over here, this one gets screwed up. And you just sit there and you move, okay, this one moves a little, this moves a little, back and forth, back and forth. And then all of a sudden, one final adjustment and everything falls into place with the thing. So so you, you can get these TVs to look beautiful if you got the mm -hmm. timing and yeah. truthfully, the equipment to do it. I mean, you, you never get that yeah. with a, you know, a, a B and K unit, uh, any of those other things from the 40s and 50s, it'll never work. It just doesn't have the capability to, to see what the full capability is of some of these things. And like I said, you're right, the 630, I mean, you get that on some good uh, test equipment to get it done right, and they are fantastic. They go right out to that sound carrier, and then they're gone after that. Talking about originality, I did a ham fest this morning in Dalton, Georgia, and I picked up something rather interesting. It's a 1952 Popular Mechanics magazine for 75 cents, and it's talking about all about television. And here's the book that makes you a TV expert, and it's a <laughs> manual, and it's a manual for the homeowner and repairman. And it talks about how to buy a TV set antennas and stuff like that how it works and how to make your own tv repairs from 1952 <laughs> i thought that was rather novel you know and something else to i can't wait to go through and see if it teaches me anything <laughs> well as we all know if you have a color tv you have to get the channel master color tv antenna because the black and white antenna is just never going to work on the color tv <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, we got to get a digital antenna now. Right, a digital antenna, exactly. <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys remember, but years ago in the Parade magazine that came in your Sunday's paper, they would advertise these uh, rabbit ears that had like a little satellite dish on top. It you know, looked like a little miniature thing. And they were talking about how wonderful it was. And finally, there was a sentence in it that said, well, you're not getting cable because you're not paying for cable but they were talking about how many stations it would bring in. But everything they said about, about, about it was actually true. But also the same would apply to a coat hanger wire as well. I have one of those little satellite dish with the rabbit ears on the side. It's kind of brown plastic kind of thing with decals on it. I, I, I've got one. I use it to bring in digital signals. <laughs> I've got three of them. I think I've even got one new in a box somewhere <laughs> that I picked up at yard sales, you know. And you find that stuff occasionally at uh, yard sales. People stuff it in their attic or something. And, mm. and then the millennials sell the house out. And there you find something that's uh, antique. 